everyone. I'm Charlie Froman with the American College of Healthcare Trustees, and I'm joined by David Levian, the president of the organization. And we're pleased to host today Robert Steele, uh, CEO of Empowering Benefits, mpb.health. Uh, not just because we're all in healthcare, but really because a lot of us are football fans. And we timed today's event to generate some excitement before this weekend's divisional round of the NFL playoffs. And um, we know some NFL veterans in our peer group, so we invited them. Uh, I think David invited uh, David Vaughn as well from the Indianapolis Colts from the early 70s. And Robert was a wide receiver on the Dallas Cowboys when they won the Super Bowl and I believe 1977 or 78, Robert will, cor will correct me. And he went on to do big things in sales and marketing and finance and is a benefactor and very involved with a business school in North Alabama. And he jumped at the idea, you know, let's uh, invite entrepreneurs who love football, to talk football, uh, entrepreneur lessons, lessons for life and have a good time. Uh, David, do you want to make a brief comment about the trustees? Well, I think most of the people on the call know that the American College of Healthcare Trustees has a mission of promoting good governance, good leadership, and good decision making in healthcare. And we invite fellows, uh, people to join. We have um, board members, C-suite members. We have health lawyers. Um, we have lots of physicians, nurses and experts of all sorts, but we also welcome any serious uh, lay person who wants to make healthcare better. Having said that, I'm gonna let our guest of honor take it away. I'm in awe of anyone who has the athletic ability to uh, play in the NFL. And, and um, so thank you, Robert. We're honored to have you speaking with us. Lo love to love to love being here, sir. Thanks for uh, the invitation and thanks for allowing me to uh, to be a part. Uh, so I, 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 I love uh, the fact that uh, you've allowed me to be on. I, I do have an interesting background. Uh, I have I got licensed to sell insurance uh, in 1976, believe it or not. So I've been at this career a pretty long time. I have focused on four areas uh, of the business world. Uh, I, I obviously, when I was 19, I was a sophomore in college. I, I did have my first job. It's funny, I've had a couple of uh, podcasts where they said, you know, one of the key questions was, what was your first job out of college? And of course, my first job out of college was playing for the world champion Dallas Cowboys. And of course, let me correct that, uh, Charlie. Um, I actually didn't play on the team that beat Denver in 77. But what I did is I showed up in 1978. The game was played actually in 78 for the 77 season. But I showed up in 78 to make the world champion Dallas Cowboys. If you'll go back to a, a movie that was made a few years ago uh, based on Vince Papali's life, he made the, the last place Philadelphia Eagles in Dick Vermeil's first season in 1976 and had a movie made after him. Well, I had the misfortune of making the world champion Dallas Cowboys two seasons later under, you know, coach Tom Landry and Dan Reeves and Mike Ditka. And, um, and yet I got to meet Vince Papali at a, a gala with uh, uh, Emmett uh, Smith a few years ago. And I went up and, you know, introduced myself. We chit chatted about, you know, playing and, and I said, you know, I, uh, I didn't have to make the, world or I didn't have to make the last place Eagles. I had to make the world champion Cowboys. She said, yeah, but I got a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Robert, we have a, a couple of acquaintances, um, Mike Ditka and Tony Dorsett, acquaintances of mine. I grew up in a little steel mill town called Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and I both understand. of those guys, and my wife went to high school with Tony. Um, her maiden name was Campbell. She sat behind Tony all the years of junior high and high school. <laughs> Interesting. Well, he Tony sat behind her. No, no. Tony became a good friend. And Ditka, uh -oh. I, I had dinner with Ditka a few years ago. And I said, Mike, you know, I really am upset with you because had you gone to Denver, I'm sorry, had you gone to Chicago in 81 versus 82, I'd have been a bear. Uh, <laughs> he, he looks at me and laughs and he says, you know what, you're right. 
because uh, I ended up playing two seasons. I played for the Cowboys in 70, uh, in 78, and then 79 with the Vikings. And uh, I'm, I'm going to share a story about goal setting, uh, if that's okay, in a little bit. But um, uh, Mike did become a, uh, is a good personal friend is, and, and has been a mentor of mine for, for many, many years. And so I loved the Cowboys and I've got some stories to share with you guys about that. And, and again, feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I've got, you know, a handful of notes, but happy to, to have the conversation. And, and I got to tell you, I was not, let me just say it this way. I was never the best player on any football team or any baseball team that I ever played on. Not ever. I actually had a chance to play pro baseball. And I still was never the best player on a baseball team. I was never the best player on, on any of my football teams from elementary school to middle school, to high school, to college, to pro. Uh, the, the one thing I will say is if you go to my high school, Hardaway high school in Columbus, Georgia today and ask any of my, uh, you know, high school peers, who would be the least likely person to have ever played pro football? and my name would be the first name on the list. Really? Uh, oh yeah, no question about it. And, and, and the reason for that is when I graduated from high school, I had only played one season of football. I didn't even play my, sorry, I played my freshman season, never got to even step on the football field. No kidding. I didn't even play my sophomore year because I was so frustrated with the fact that, you know, the coaches, you know, uh, you know, and, and every ball player says, well, the coach doesn't like me or the coach doesn't. Know. No, I was terrible. And so uh, I didn't even play my sophomore year. I went back out my junior year and never got to play with the exception of holding uh, for extra points. And uh, I ended up, uh, you know, they, they the, you know, the team knew I had good hands. And then I finally got to step on the field my senior season. Uh, and I, you know, I, you know, ended up making, uh, all city and all that stuff. And then I, but I only weighed 155 pounds and I get to college. I can't bench press a hundred pounds. I end up going through team two knee surgeries, my freshman spring, my sophomore fall guys back in those days, seventies and, and early eighties, you, you have one knee surgery, you're done. And that was in my freshman year in college. You have the second knee surgery on the second knee, and you are done, done. And so I ended up having a good two seasons, my sophomore, uh, uh, se junior, and senior seasons. And lo and behold, I was getting ready to go into the insurance business. I was uh, getting ready to graduate. I had zero interest in playing pro football. I had no, I mean, no communication. I, I could, I could tell a whole bunch of other stories around how this all shook out. But anyway, long story short, the Cowboys showed up to North Alabama, not necessarily a football powerhouse. Does anybody know the first player that was the first, not, not the first player, the first player that won rookie of the year in 1954? Anybody know the name of that person? Davon, you know? <laughs> nope. Harlan Hill, Chicago Bears. Harlan Hill graduated from Florence State Teachers College in 1954. So when Robert Steele shows up to the Dallas Cowboys in 1978, no other player had ever played in the NFL besides Harlan Hill. So I get to training camp, guys. And, of course, I only have three seasons of football under my belt, two in college and one in high school. And I did. I, I, the day I signed my contract in my little apartment in Florence, Alabama, a feeling came over me that said, you're going to make this team. Now, guys, I didn't share that with anybody. Why? Because everybody would have thought I was crazy, number one. And everybody would have been trying to create a soft landing pad for me, like my parents, uh, because they knew that the chances of me making the, the world champion Dallas Cowboys were slim and none from North Alabama. But I'm not kidding you. A piece came over me and I said, I'm going to make the team. But in order to make the team, I got to put work in. And so I worked from that day until training camp opened 12 hours a day, uh, six days a week, four hours a day on Sunday until training camp opened. And all I can tell you is I didn't break a sweat when training camp opened up. What was more interesting, guys, was I showed up number 20 on a depth chart of 20. 
not where you want to start, right, Charlie? No. Well, guess who the first four receivers were? Oh, and the Cowboys only carry four receivers. Drew Pearson and uh, Golden Richards, the starters in Super Bowl XII, and Tony Hill and Butch Johnson, you know, guys that just barely got to play football, you know. And uh, so they, I'm, I'm staring four superstars in the back, and there are 15 other people in front of me, including those four, and they only carry four receivers. So how do you think I felt the day I walk into training camp and I'm number 20 on the depth chart of 20? Would anybody like to venture to what I felt like? Not very good. Not true, Charlie. I actually Nothing spot- to lose. The only way to go is up. Bingo. No, no. Bingo. That great answer. I actually smiled at the depth chart and I said, game on. I got nowhere to go but up. And all these guys got somewhere else to go. I made the first cut, made the second cut, made the third cut. I was literally supposed to be the first guy cut and made the fifth cut, made the sixth cut. And I mentioned to Charlie, I was going to say this yesterday is that uh, we get to the end of training, literally the end of training camp, and I'm still on the, on, on the field. And uh, Landry called rolls, he, and every, every day at 6 o'clock, he calls a roll, and he says Stahlback, and Stahlback says present with his naval background. And I couldn't say present right after Roger did, so I said here, still here. Roger Stahl, I mean, uh, 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 Drew Pearson in the back of the room goes, still here? Why are you still here? <laughs> and Landry started laughing, literally, and you know, you guys know this, Landry started smiling. He actually didn't break out in a full laugh, but he actually did chuckle. And, uh, and, and that's when I knew that I, I had a shot. So I went to Ditka the next day and I said, uh, have the Cowboys ever carried five receivers? He said, nope. I said, then how am I going to make this team? He said, you better get on the special teams. So, uh, uh, and of course, Mike was the special teams coach and the receiver coach at the time. I, I, I got put into the, um, uh, into the to, and I actually played every single game of special teams. And I ended up making a, 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 catch, a, a catch in my first uh, uh, NFL game uh, against the uh, San Francisco 49ers, OJ's last game, by the way, or last season. And lo and behold, the Cowboys traded uh, Golden Richards to Chicago and made a spot for me, and I became the fourth receiver. So I know we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the playoffs coming up. I did get to play in, uh, uh, you know, not only the entire season of 78, played in the first playoff game against the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, we actually did win the game, went on to play Los Angeles in the old stadium, Coliseum, and uh, – we ended up winning that game as well. Had some great, memorable, uh, you know, uh, plays from a standpoint of special teams, and then got to play at Super Bowl thirteen in the old uh, Orange Bowl in Miami, and we lost the game 35-31. What? What? They're, they're great memories, but uh, I'll tell you, one of the best memories is uh, right before the uh, playoffs started, we picked up Jackie Smith because Jay Saldy broke his hand in the last game of the season. And we broke, we, we picked up Jay Saldy. Mike come, Ditka comes to me and says, hey, Robert, number 81's, I was number 81. He said, Robert, number 81's your number. You're always going to be number 81, long as you want to be number 81. And I knew Mike was headed somewhere. I just didn't know where. And I said, Mike, what's this about? He goes, well, you, you know, Jay Saldy broke his hand. I said, yes, sir. I said, and, and why does this involve me? He said, well, we picked up Jackie Smith. Oh, did I tell you Jackie Smith's going to be in the Hall of Fame? We you know, played 19 seasons for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. I said, uh, no, sir, but uh, you know, thank you for sharing. I said, what does this have to do with me? He said, well, you know, Jackie wore number 81 for 19 seasons. And I said, Mike, stop right there. As long as I have a locker in the morning, a jersey with any number in the world on it, and shoes, cleats, I- I'm-, I'm in. And so sure enough, I get a letter, an email from Jackie about four years ago. He was talk, he wanted me to coach his son on some things. And he sends the email back thanking me for, you know, having a conversation with his son. And he ended the salutation with Jackie Smith, number 81, because you let me be. That's the kind of guy Jackie Smith was. And that's the kind of fun that we had. And that's how 
you know, I remember my time with the Cowboys and that's why I am a Cowboy for life. One of the things that, you know, if I, if, you know, I'm happy to entertain some questions if you guys have any about, you know, the, the sports and athletics, but I did want to share a couple of business conversations, if you don't mind, about the Cowboys. And so I shared with Charlie yesterday that um, most of you guys may or may not know this, but, you know, everybody has heard, you know, and saw the movie Moneyball about the Oakland A's. And I'm going to submit to you that Moneyball was named wrongly for the wrong team. The Dallas Cowboys were Moneyball before the Oakland A's could spell Moneyball. They actually had a business from day one. Clint Murchison hired uh, uh, Tech Schramm at, to be president of the football operations. He hired Tom Landry to be the head coach, and he hired Gil Brandt to be the player personnel director. He basically sat him down in a room and said, you gentlemen are my choices. You will be my choices for as long as you continue to work the way we want to work together, as a business should. And for 29 seasons, these three gentlemen were their equals in every sense of the word. Schramm made this Amer America's team. Landry made this America's team. And Gil Brandt put the players on the field to make this America's team. And I will submit to you, no other team for 29 seasons truly had what the Cowboys had. The Cowboys used computers in 1977-78 to scout every single team. We had a, you know, you remember the old green bar paper. We had a scouting report this thick every game of the tendencies, what a team did on first and 10, second and short, second and long. I mean, every stat, every stat we studied every week. And I'm telling you, these guys were good. I'll share one more story. Um, I wrote an article. I'm happy to share it with you, Charlie. Y'all can share it with the rest of the group. I wrote an article uh, shortly after I got out of the Cowboys and, and back in business, and that was what Landry, Reeves, and Ditka taught me about dot, dot, dot business. So I saw my time with the Cowboys as my MBA, if you will, studying the business practices of the Cowboys. And so Landry was the consummate CEO. He coached the coaches and he let the coaches coach the players. Uh, um, Dan Reeves was the consummate student of the game. He was the one that studied all those green bar papers. He's the one that knew the tendencies. He's the one that was the free agent from South Carolina that probably shouldn't have made it either and ultimately became a disciple of, of Landry and you know, went on to do some pretty good things in his own coaching career. And of course, Mike Ditka was the passionate crazy man that would run through a brick wall as a coach and ask you to run behind him. He would lead the way. He wanted you to be as passionate. And the only time I saw Ditka get wet mad with any player is when they did not go full speed every day on every play. He would get angry about that. And so that's one of the things that uh, that I learned from, you know, my time with, you know, Coach Landry, Coach Reeves and Coach Ditka. And, and I got to tell you, I I also did something, you know, that most people don't do this day in the NFL is when I got there, I didn't speak to anyone. I didn't speak to the media. I didn't speak to anybody. I kept my mouth shut because I was told by Harlan Hill prior to me going out, he said, Robert, they don't want to hear from you with your mouth. They want to see what you can do on the field. And if you do that, you'll stick around. And if you don't, you'll be gone. And that's when he said, go full speed every day on every play. And I can tell you, I did. Uh, right before the end of training camp, Gil Brandt came up to me and said, Robert, you had a really good training camp. And I said, well, thank you, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Brandt. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but I appreciate that. And he goes, Robert, we keep stats on everything. I mean, literally almost how many times you go to the bathroom every day? We keep stats. He said, you have, we kept stat on every single ball that was ever thrown your way. He said, you, have, you had the highest pass catch ratio in the history of training camp. That was 26, uh, 24 seasons at that time. And uh, no, 27 seasons at that time. I ended up 
uh, again, getting ni- a nickname from the from the defensive backs, not any of the other players. The defensive back called me uh, Flypaper. That was my nickname. So obviously, I must have done something good. So uh, Charlie mentioned some of my 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 background. I have started four companies. Uh, I love the insurance, the employee benefits, the financial services, and the healthcare space. I believe that every decision we make today uh, from those four areas, the, every purchase is a financial purchase, purchase, whether it be insurance or benefits or financial services or healthcare, it's all a financial purchase. And therefore we shouldn't separate those. We should be as good of a healthcare consumer as we are a car consumer or a computer consumer or a house consumer or any other consumer. And we don't do that. We just aren't taught that way. We don't consume healthcare care that way. And that's why we don't have really the transparency in healthcare that we should have to become better consumers. And we don't have the knowledge that we should have. And basically everybody, when they get to purchase of healthcare, they check out a life and they say, uh, just tell me what to do, where to go. And actually they don't do that. They end up going to the, a friend and say, well, you know, tell me where to go to get my needs replaced. Uh, we use a tool with our company uh, called Healthcare Blue Book. Check it out. Uh, I look, I, I, I'm a healthcare consumer, so I can't preach what I don't, uh, I can't teach what I don't, or I can't uh, teach or preach what I don't live. So when I was getting ready to do, have both of my knees replaced in 19, uh, in 2015, uh, I searched, scoured the, the earth literally to find where, where would be the highest quality of care for that double knee replacement, because I was going to get both of them done at one time. That's also crazy. Uh, get both of them done at one time, and I wanted it at the best possible cost. Highest outcome, best possible cost. I used a tool called Healthcare Blue Book. I had purchased that tool because uh, I was running the health plan for the company I was working for, and I found a, a, a surgeon in uh, Park City, Utah, that was what we call a green, green provider, which means highest quality, lowest cost. And so I ended up uh, going to that facility. Perfect results, by the way. I had a choice of 28,000 across the country to 128,000. I could have gone to the 128,000. I was my out of pocket was $5,000. Didn't matter, you know, past that. But I went to the 28,000 facility and, you know, clinic, and it was an amazing, uh, not only surgery outcome uh, recovery, and, you know, I'm actually better off now than I ever was. And I actually got two inches taller as a result of the surgery. So, um, so anyway, uh, Charlie also mentioned the, 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 the North Alabama, University of North Alabama um, uh, offered me a scholarship. They should have cut me, you know, probably, you know, after the second knee surgery, but they chose to stick with me. Uh, and as a result of that, they have put me in the Hall of Fame uh, at North Alabama. I'm also on the uh, marketing council and I'm also on the board, uh, the uh, foundation board for the university. And a few years ago, they asked me to uh, uh, to become the benefactor for the sales center. And, and today, the Steel Center for Professional Sales at the University of North Alabama, you can check it out at uh, steelsalescenter.com. Uh, we have 125 students in the program. We teach professional selling. We're the only, we're the only accredited uh, program in the state of Alabama for a degree in, in professional sales. And so we graduate about uh, 25 a year. 100% of those get jobs, good incomes. So we have 100% placement. And I am very proud of of what we're doing there. We are truly teaching how to create a paycheck for life. And so my, my, one of my next comments is, you know, about healthcare again, is, um, what I'm teaching folks today from, from a healthcare perspective in the employer world is that if you wanna bend the healthcare cost curve from an employer and employee's perspective, you gotta get in front of the insurance companies. And that means that you've gotta use, whether it be direct primary care or some other virtual healthcare or telemedicine or some other scenario, you gotta get in front, uh, get the employees before they go start spending money. Instead of spending the 128,000, they need to be spending the 28,000. And we've got to get in front of healthcare. So we've got to purchase healthcare differently, and we've got to purchase health insurance differently. If we don't do that, 
two things are going to continue to happen. Health insurance premiums are continuing to escalate and the bukas of the world are going to continue to be fat, dumb, and happy as they celebrate their stock prices going up. And I can, I can preach on and on and on about that, about the who, what, when, where, why of that. But at the end of the day, you, there are only a few things that you can do right in that. Uh, but what we do know in, since 2010, with the pass, passing of the Affordable Care Act, and the, um, the fact that the insurance companies has to pay out an 80-20 split of premiums or have to do a refund, the, the in, in premiums have to go up so insurance companies can continue making a profit and continue paying all their high salaries. And uh, you know, I've got charts of, of you know, what the stock prices have done in the last five years. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off that soapbox, but Ultimately, I am, you can probably tell I'm a little passionate. Uh, Dick rubbed, rubbed off on me a lot more than he probably thought he did. But I love what we're doing at, you know, Empowering Benefits and MPB.health. And I love, you know, where I've come from and where I am headed because I'm not planning on slowing down anytime soon. So I'm happy to slow down a little bit. Uh, I, I see a, t a question. What was tougher, the NFL or the Georgia State Legislature? Uh, and sorry for uh, Greg Cole, you being mad about the Atlanta game. I actually got a penalty. I, I don't know if you remember the game, but uh, you you will remember this if you watch the, that game. The Falcons came out um, in the second half and uh, got the kickoff, and I ended up getting a penalty, which is one of the other only times that Mike Ditka really almost blew me up. Uh, I got a penalty on a kickoff for, and, and typically, you know, the, the, the second guy that pick, you know, that swings gets the penalty. I got a penalty for a linebacker that tried to take my head off and the ref threw the flag on me. And I've got a picture in my house of Dick slamming his board on the, on the, on the ground. Falcons ended up moving the ball to about the 35 yard line on the second half kickoff. Do you remember that bill? I see you shaking your head. Uh, so, uh, fortunately had the Falcons scored and won that game, I would have been cut the day that day. And I would not have played in Super Bowl 13. However, uh, too tall Jones, big guy that he was sacked Bartowski three straight uh, plays and put him back into about the 25 yard line coming out. That saved my job, saved my life, saved my career, saved my world. So, Ed Tuttle Jones is, is my hero for life, uh, but that's what allowed us to move forward and get onto the uh, onto the uh, NFC Championship game. So, what was tougher than the NFL or Georgia Legislature? So, I had another a moment like that. Uh, I had I tried to defeat a 12 year Democrat incumbent in a in a uh, in a House delegation that was uh, seven Democrats. And uh, they, they were basically, you know, the, the, the good old buddy system. And of course, uh, our speaker at the time, Tom Murphy, was the longest tenured speaker in the history of the country. And it was about a 90 to 10 split of, of Democrats versus Republicans. So any Democrat, uh, Speaker Murphy used to just kind of do like this. Republicans are like flies. I just have to shoo them off. And so uh, I ended up winning. Uh, uh, so, by, and by the way, the, the lady that I beat was a 65 year old librarian. The media made me look like an idiot because they presented me as this, you know, 32 year old football player that's trying to beat up on this uh, 65 year old librarian. That wasn't what it was. Uh, I, I presented the, the issues, which was she was the first uh, elected official in the state of Georgia to endorse Michael Dukakis for president, you know, in, in that in 1980. Uh, uh, 89 uh, or 88 campaign. And so um, I ended up beating her. She had, she had an 88% approval rating when I beat her. That's, so I like challenges. You got to understand, I like challenges. So I ended up winning. I served two terms. I got voted out of office because I did my job. I voted uh, how I should vote based on what's the, the based on each bill. And I didn't care if it was a Republican bill or a Democrat bill. Uh, I voted my conscience and I voted uh, what I thought was the right thing to do. The Chamber of Commerce, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, voted me the highest voting record for business issues in the history, uh, or not in history, but for the state for those two years, back to back. So I, I do take credit in that. I hated 
politics. I loved running. I hated the serving part. And, and I, I could go in that into, into more detail, but it was hard. It is like making sausage. It is nasty. It's, it's all about what can you do for me? And uh, so um, the, I will say making the t Cowboys was harder than, than winning the Georgia you know, legislature race. But the, 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 the fact that you're making $12,000 a year and it's a 24 seven job and you still have a job to get a paycheck, you know, coming into the family, it's, that's the hardest job. It is the hardest job of all, especially when, you know, you're, you're not in it for the money. So that, I appreciate that question. Uh, uh, go ahead. You can raise your hand uh, anytime you want. Robert, I would, I would say that that's a fantastic presentation and hopefully we'll hear even a little bit more because I'm in awe of what you've achieved. I firmly believe that football provides some of the greatest lessons in life. And I always used to tell my kids, you don't tell somebody what you can do, you show them. So I think your point was very well taken. And that's just one of the many lessons that football teaches. And of course, many people feel that the health care is a contact sport. Oh, it is. In a way, it, it really is. And it shouldn't be because it's supposed to be a healing, uh, healing profession. But uh, I think that football teaches kids and young people some of the most important lessons in life. And perhaps you'd um, want to talk about some of the other lessons that football has taught you. So I will say, well, two things, and I, I, don't, I appreciate you saying that. I, I will say I, I grew up in the deep south. So you can appreciate, you know, the 60s, come, growing up in the 60s in the deep south, um, it, it was interesting. I'll say that. Uh, I will also say that I was raised by two parents that um, did not have a racist bone in their body. In fact, uh, um, if, if you, um, my dad used to own the hotel in Columbus, Georgia, and he also owned the, the double A Columbus uh, Yankees. And Roy White was the first African-American baseball player in the Southern League. Uh, in 1961. And so uh, my dad had to find hotel rooms for the 23 players. And my dad tells me this, you know, told me the story uh, about how he called Charlotte or Asheville, one of the North Carolina cities at the time, and asked for 23 rooms. And the hotel proprietor said, Mr. Steele, uh, we only have 22 rooms available. He says, no, 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 you've kept my team the whole time. Uh, we've been, we've coming up here. We've got uh, 23 players. We need 23 rooms. He said, Mr. Steele, we only have 22 rooms available. He said, uh, you have 85 rooms. You're telling me that uh, the others are, are all full. He said, we only have 22 rooms available. Well, we all know what that meant. He did not want Roy White to be staying at his hotel. So my dad bust the team uh, almost 30 miles outside the city to find a hotel that uh, would take them all. And so Fritz Peterson posted on his Facebook page a few years ago for Martin Luther King Day. He said, if the, if the Baseball Hall of Fame had a civil rights wing, Richard Steele's name would be in there. That's how I was raised. So I, like, I do like kidding, like, like to say, there's no way I could be racist. I've taken more showers with black people than I have white people playing sports, right? Well, so uh, A little bit so, like Jack, Jack Kemp. But um, uh, the yeah, uh, no question, and I and I got to meet Jack Kemp uh, when I was in politics. He was a great man. Well, one of one of my children played for a formerly all black football team because they'd played Pop Warner since they were about eight. And uh, when we moved to Philadelphia, the team that he could play for was uh, in West Philadelphia. The the children treated my child so well. And he was a towhead. His hair was white. It was as white as the driven snow. And the children treated him so well. And the parents treated my wife and uh, me so well. So it was a, a great experience. No, that, no, that's awesome. No, so, so your comment uh, is absolutely spot on. Sports, there's a couple of things sports does in my, in my, in my mind's eye. Uh, number one, it does teach you how to work together. 
you know, I was never the quarterback on any football team I ever played on. So I had to, you know, I had to work with the other team. You know, I took directions from the quarterback. I took directions from the coaches. <laughs> it is a team sport. And so, you know, while golf and tennis, you know, are truly individual sports, uh, you don't get the same a camaraderie. You don't get the same uh, ability to learn how to get along and pull together as a, as a team or unit or group. And so I learned a whole lot about that. In fact, I, I'll share this quick story. I, I, I merged a company in uh, Rockville, Maryland with a company that I owned in, in Atlanta that was doing benefits administration. And at the time, I, I was trying to figure out how to blend these two cultures together. So I ended up pulling the groups together. We met in the middle uh, somewhere in Tennessee, I think it was. And we met in the middle and I showed the movie, Remember the Titans. I don't know if you remember that football movie or not. I think it's one of the best uh, football movies uh, that, that has been made. Um, I, I love Blind Side and I actually thought ben, Vince Papali's movie was good, but I, I didn't, it wasn't like Blind Side or it wasn't like uh, Remember the Titans. I love Remember the Titans. And so I, I showed that movie and, and, and my, my premise was, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're a two diverse companies. We need to merge together and we're going to have differences of opinion, but we're going to work together. And obviously my goal here is to really just help us understand how to, you know, one plus one needs to equal five or seven or nine, not just one plus one equals two or three. So we ended up merging the companies together. It worked out really, really well. I let literally the, uh, the senior staff of, uh, of that company become my senior staff and it, it ended up working out pretty well. So, um, uh, you know, I've, I, again, I've had some really unique experiences uh, having, you know, worked in, in the world uh, as much as I have. And I've got a hundred more stories I could share business wise in terms of how I've been able to, you know, successfully transform companies that were in, you know, upside down. Uh, Cause that's what I love doing is, is finding people that don't know how to sell what they have and show them how to do that. Anyway, any other questions? Well, Robert, Charlie here. I, I would invite a quick comment on this weekend's divisional round. I was pretty impressed by your Cowboys. They made a late season run with that veteran quarterback from Cincinnati, but Right. You know, too little, too late. Um, also, after you talk about that, I'd invite some of the, the other panelist attendees to talk also about business and football. I know Bill Green is from Pittsburgh country, and it, it seems like that culture of Southwest Pennsylvania produces a lot of hard nosed business types. And so Bill definitely reminds me of one of those. Is that true, Bill? Well, I'm going to tell Robert, I had a couple stories for him. One, in 1979, I was not a Steeler fan. I loved going to school in Pittsburgh. I bet the Cowboys, and I bet over, and killed on that game. So I was happy about that. I did, after that, became a Steeler fan. The one time I was golfing out in Alquitter, <laughs> which Terry probably knows about, too, and I, I hit this shot that was unbelievably great on a part three, and it bounced out of the hole. I was walking down. I was so mad. I couldn't control myself. The next thing I know, a piece of a golf club went flying across the fairway. And I was like, well, that guy's obviously more upset than me. And Mike Ditka was across the water and had wrapped his driver around a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a funny golf Ditka story as well, if we have time. But um, we do. Tell it, please. <laughs> so I, I was not a golfer. I, I'm a avid golfer right now. I, I, I lived in Vegas for 10 years and no kidding guys. I played golf every single day. I was in Vegas when I lived there for 10 years, every single day. If you play every single day, you better get good. Right. But anyway, I was playing uh, on a uh, scramble tournament. One of the tournaments that was held around Dallas. It was, this was 1979. And I ended up doing in a, in a long drive contest in the tournament. It was at, uh, I'll tell you where the course was. It was the course that uh, Jordan Spieth grew up in, uh, uh, grew up on in Dallas. And so it's a club court course now. It was actually the first club court uh, uh, club that they bought. But anyway, long story short, Ditka is, uh, you know, I ended up hitting a ball and I didn't even know what a long drive contest was. Uh, and so I walked down the fairway and the guys are going, uh, 
well, well, your ball is past the sign. I said, well, what does that mean? Uh, they go, uh, well, that means that you outdrove whoever just drove it, you know, to there. And I said, okay, still don't know what that really means. And so they put my name on the board. We get up there uh, for the awards and uh, they call out all the other prizes and they use the, for some reason, use the long drive for last. And they said, and the long drive champion is, and Mike Ditka stands up and starts walking towards the podium. This is who Ditka is, right? And so <laughs> they said, Robert Steele. <laughs> Ditka is fuming. He's, he's livid. He's crazy. So, you know, it was like a dozen golf balls or something. And so uh, he walks over to me after we're done, and I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing turf cleats. I'm wearing my game shoes because that's all I had. I didn't play golf. And so he walks up and he starts humming and hawing and, you know, fussing and cussing. And I says, coach, do you want this, the dozen golf balls? He says, yeah, yeah. And he said a few things that I won't tell. And, uh, and he looks at me and he's still stammering and just about to blow up. And he says, well, let me tell you one more thing. If I ever catch you on a golf course in turf cleats, I'm going to fire your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, coach, I'm yep. sorry. Very cool. Very cool. All right, guys. Uh, any other Robert, questions? Did you have a comment on this weekend's divisional round or the season NFL today? Well, Robert? Uh, no, no, I appreciate that. I, I don't have, you know, I, I really, um, I'll be quite candid, Charlie. I'm not a, a, as big a fan as you would probably think. Uh, I typically only watch about one game a season. Uh, and it's a combination of a bunch of games. Uh, I end up, I'd rather be, I hate to say this, but I'd rather be playing golf than, uh, than watching something on TV. I mean, I, I, I just haven't been a, a big, big fan. I've probably only been, no, no kidding, Charlie, I've only been to probably five football games since I played. Wow. That was almost wow. 30 years ago or 42 mm. years ago, I guess. Uh, but anyway, um, is that obviously the – the, the football field is smaller than it ever has been. It's still 55 yards wide and 100 yards long, but it's smaller because the players are faster than they've ever been. They're quicker than they've ever been, and they're bigger than they've ever been. And so the field has shrunk. And so, the, you know, the, the players – and, and I've, I've got some, you know, stories of – you know, I, I did, a, I did a, a talk a few years ago uh, to Teladoc uh, about uh, uh, the Super Bowl that uh, that New England beat uh, Atlanta. I hate to upset another Atlanta fan, but uh, basically I, I talked about um, what ha what happens at halftime in an NFL game, and I'm, I'm happy to come back and share that that conversation with you another time. But you know, typically, uh, you know, these players that are playing now are so good that it only takes a few things. I mean. Think about now, then, you know, picking on New England a little bit. I love, I hate to say this, but I love the fact that Tom Brady is now with the, uh, the Bucks because the only person in NFL history that has 20 winning seasons in a row is two, Tom Landry. Okay. How many did uh, Belichick have? 19. 19. Had Tom Brady stayed, guess what would have happened? <laughs> I didn't know that. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> I think a quid pro quo happened there. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so, so, I, you know, obviously um, the, the love between Brady and Belichick has, has waned quite a bit because this, you know, Belichick's going to be in the Hall of Fame, so is Brady. So are you saying that both Tom Landry and uh, the Miami Dolphins owe a favor to the New England Patriots? I think so. I know. I, I, I sense so. a conspiracy here. So, uh, so, 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 yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, and I, Tom Brady is, you know, it, much like Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning was an offensive coordinator on the football field. We all know that. Peyton Manning is is almost a head coach on the football field. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw the article that was written the other day, where it talked about, uh, you know, the, the sometimes the. A coach of the Bucks, and I can't even tell you who he is, but uh, he gets mad with Brady because the players look to Brady versus him. Bruce Arians. <laughs> Bruce yeah. Arians. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Bruce Arians. Pittsburgh guy. There go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, can I say, can I say something real quick? I got two bones of contention with you. Number one, the best football movie is Rudy. Uh. Just my opinion. <laughs> you know what? I, I, you know, uh, 
course, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with that. I think Rudy was a great movie, by the way. Yes, it was. I'm just I'm just messing around. Second, I'm not an Atlanta fan, but you taught your team taught me a valuable lesson not not to bet with my heart and try to yeah. bet with my head. I was a 17 year old kid. It was the first time I ever took a serious bet in the Super Bowl. And uh, I was a Giant fan. I grew up very close to Giant Stadium. So it was the Jets and the Giants for me. But I could not say it because of our love for the Giants. We could not stand the Dallas Cowboys. It was uh, you guys were the enemy. <laughs> so, so so I've got a, I've got I actually a great I got a great uh, Jet story, and I've got a an okay uh, Giant story. My first game in the NFL was at Giant Stadium, and uh, really? okay, in, in the Meadowlands, and mm-hmm. so uh, I I was a season ticket holder, by the way. Okay. Well, that was my yeah. that was my very first live NFL game. Uh, you know, pre- preseason is I, I don't call those live games. So uh, I, I'm running down the first kickoff. I literally look up and two guys are pointing at me. One's pointing high, one's pointing low, and I knew that that meant that I'm not going to live the the rest of the day. And so I get n- annihilated on the kickoff. My first one. I come limping off the field, and uh, Landry goes are you okay? I said, I don't, I, I, I actually don't think so coach. And <laughs> Hollywood Henderson comes over to me and says, welcome to the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that was my first giants uh, game in Meadowlands uh, memory. Robert, have you met many other NFL veterans or other professional veterans in um, benefits or finance in your career over the past couple of decades? Believe it or not, Charlie, I've only met a handful. Um, uh, I've, I'm actually mentoring a guy now that uh, that played at UNA and also played, uh, you know, for uh, Caroline and a, and a couple of other teams. And I'm mentoring him, and and he's getting ready to start a company. And I, I really have given a lot of time to you know uh, guys. I actually want to launch a sports uh, to sales <laughs> program. <clears throat> you know, most guys, most people think that, you know, pro sports athletes are overpaid and most are, but guys like me played two seasons. I, my first contract was $20,000 a year. Think about that guys. I made $20,000 for my first season in the NFL. I, I'd love to launch a, what I call sports to sales, showing people how, when they, you know, when they get out of ball, they, and they don't take care of their money. They need to learn, they need to transition and they just don't need to sell cars unless they want to sell cars or sell insurance, believe it or not, I <laughs> sell insurance, but they, uh, what, what they need to do is be taught, you know, if they want to be in sales, taught, because most people want to use them and abuse them for their reputation and their, and, and, and their connections, and then throw them away when they don't make it. And that's a sad, sad story for me. And so I've been fortunate and I, I want to do that. And I'm going to try to do an extension of the steel center to do something like that. And I hope to be able to pull that off. Well, Robert, I'd love to pick your brain about, um, obviously you have a, this is Jared Wallen. I'm a, a urologic surgeon, young guy, uh, out of training a few years now, but I'd love to, you know, from your legislative uh, actions previously, and obviously you, you have a decent grasp of the, the healthcare industry. I think one of the biggest challenges for physicians is, is their lack of, of lobbying, right, and, and power in that, in that regard. So what would you say as far as recommendations in that regard to, you know, potentially kind of increase that, that grasp and, and that power? What are, what are good resources for that? So I'd say, I'd say a couple of things. You know, one, uh, I think it was Tip O'Neill who said politics is local. And right. so if you, if you believe that, and I do believe that, uh, everybody believes that their, you know, state legislator is, is a great guy hates all other politicians, but the guy that is their guy or gal is a great guy or gal. And so what I would say is get involved locally first, because you can make changes. You can get to know these people, whether they be in the, in your state legislature or, you know, Congress uh, or, you know, in the Senate, you can meet those people. You can get to know those people and you can, you know, bend their ear on what needs to be done from a healthcare perspective. I, I, I'm not a big fan. I hate to say it this way, but I'm not a big, big fan of national lobbying organizations because it's all about the money. You know, it's truly, you know, I want what I want and I'm willing to pay what I need to pay. 
Uh, but local, you can actually convince people. Uh, and, and again, that becomes a grassroots. If we all were doing you know, that on the local level, we're going to would be in much better shape. You know, that, that would be the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is um, I would never run for public office again, not because, you know, it's it's it, you know, it's a cesspool, but because, uh, you know, it's just not what I want to do with my time. And I, I'm a big proponent and I preach this, at, you know, where, where, you know, where I'm CEO is what is the highest and best use of your time today? And so, you know, as a, as a surgeon, I mean, you know, literally you, the highest and best use of your time is doing what you do. So, uh, so, so again, I, uh, I, um, I don't say don't get involved in politics, but I, I am a big proponent of what is the highest and best use of your time. And, and, and but also, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about business, you know, some of that time does need to be spent obviously with family and with friends and with relaxing activities and not just, you know, you know, trying to, you know, kill the world or tackle the world or conquer the world. But again, I do believe that uh, politics is local and I do believe that folks should, um, should be active in their local areas. And Jared, uh, this is Dave Levy and I'm the president of the American College of Healthcare Trustees. And uh, your question is is a great one. Uh, Charlie Froman, who's on this call, and I think that was his daughter who you just saw, uh, he is the executive director of advocacy and lobbying for our group. And our group, our group um, is not, uh, it's to promote good governance and leadership and decision-making in healthcare. And sure. we do, we do um, advocate for physicians and surgeons very strongly, not necessarily just from a financial point of view, although we feel sure. what he should be able to make a living, but, but we advocate for physicians and surgeons because we think that the doctor-patient relationship is sacred. And one of the ways that we hope to preserve that is through advocacy. And Charlie uh, is an experienced um, lobbyist, among other things, which is why we appointed him executive director. And in the past, you know, lobbying has gotten a bad name. It's really part of the First Amendment and how Americans express themselves and make themselves uh, heard and seek redress, etc. And Charles has experience at the fulcrums of power in Washington, and he also knows um, how to deploy influence at the at the state level, and to the extent you want to get involved, we would you know welcome that very strongly. He in the past you almost had to be a Fortune 500 company to have a presence on Capitol Hill, and that's why we've started this campaign. I think it's very timely because even the larger companies now are finding that these big lobbying firms that don't provide individual service. You know, they're just a uh, line on the income statement. So niche lobbying firms are becoming more viable. And Charles is making it possible for a very, a very cost-effective way for physicians groups and others to have a voice in Capitol Hill. And of course, we only accept stints or gigs, if you will, that are consistent with our our mission, which is pretty much a, a social enterprise and what we think is is uh, best for society. To your point, and that was really my point as well, is more local groups uh, like what, you know, Charlie and you are doing uh, is is the way to go. And uh, now, again, it means that you, you, you know, you need to do local. You need to also go national. But I love the fact that you're, you're dealing with uh, you know, a, a, a population, you know, and not that all populations don't care. I, I support a bunch of different uh, groups that do a bunch of different lobbying. Uh, but again, I, I love the, the, the smaller organization is allowing us to, you know, make a difference in areas, whether it be local community, state, and ultimately national. So, you know, again, I love the mission. No, uh... <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Was this great. was fantastic, and uh, I uh, I really enjoyed it, and I think all the participants uh, did as well. And I hope we circle back and have a chance to chat soon. Well, uh, so, my pleasure. I appreciate Charlie. I appreciate the opportunity to to speak, and uh, I 
you know, appreciate uh, what you guys do as an organization. Thanks, Robert. It was great, it was great listening to you.